Hey guys, we're here to do some reverse caroling where I ask you to sing me a song. Let's go! Oh, holy night. Some people like to make snow angels. I like to make snow angel choirs. The entire choir of snow angels. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We're starting a new series today. It's called Carols, and we all sing Christmas carols all during this Christmas season. And a lot of times we sing them and we don't really pay attention to the words. I'd like to call your attention to the one, O Holy Night. How many of y'all have heard that? How many of you like it? Is that, pretty, is that a pretty good carol? What's interesting about this carol is when it was written... In around 1850, it was written by a French poet that was asked to write this. His name was Placid Capone, Placide Capone, I'm sorry. And he was the author of the hymn, and he knew about the Jesus story, but he didn't know Jesus. He was not a believer. He was known as a big party animal, and when the Catholic Church found out that he actually wrote this uh, song here, they wouldn't even sing it in the church for many, many years. And then in the early 1900s, they started singing it again. Let's take a look at this for just a minute because what, we're, what this series carols is about is about we're looking for a Savior and we're singing about Jesus. And it goes, Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. They're brightly shining. Long lay the world in sin, in arrow pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. Say hope. Hope. See, Jesus brings hope. In this world, we don't have a lot of hope, but Jesus brings all the hope. You know, we see all the things going on around us, but in Jesus, in Christ alone, is where our hope lies. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's about a man named Jesus Christ. Our hope is in him. It says, a thrill of hope, and the weary world rejoices. I don't know about you guys, but I've been in contact with a lot of people in the last week or two. There's a lot of weary people running around out there. If I describe the world and people in it, a lot of them's very weary. They're tired, they're wore down, they're beat down, and they're looking for a little bit of hope. I talked to a friend of mine, Alan, and he was telling me last month, this was this past Monday, and he says, man, when you lose hope, you lose it all. His wife's been through all kinds of health difficulties, and he's going through them with her. And he says, man, one thing we've always had, we've always had hope. So today, our hope is in Jesus Christ. Regardless what the world's doing around us, regardless what's going on around us, we have hope in a man called Jesus. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Anything that we've came up against yesterday, do you see how pretty it was this morning when we got up and we came into the church, the sun was out, we're given a new start, we're given a brand new beginning. Jesus says his tender mercies are renewed on a daily basis. Every day we have a fresh start. A thrill of hope, the, wor the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices. O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for sending Jesus Christ, your one and only son. He came and he lived on this earth. He was put to death. He was hung on the cross for our sins. And it's through him that we can accept you, that we can spend eternity with you in heaven. We praise you, Father God, today for all things. And Jesus, we just praise you. Help us worship you. Let us realize today that our hope lies in you. It lies in you alone. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, oh, holy night, the night when Christ was born. I think about this song, and I think about the manger scenes. I'm always riding around looking at manger scenes, me and the grandkids. We think they're pretty cool. We'll go, and, you know, they look pretty neat. You've got Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus and 
All of it looks pretty good. And it really looks a lot better than it was back then. It kind of does a disservice to what actually took place. Here we had a teenage girl about 13 years old riding on the back of a donkey 80 to 120 miles when she was nine months pregnant. That sounds easy, don't it, ladies? Huh? I remember when my wife was going to give birth and when she's going to the hospital in the car, and that was an experience just going to the hospital. I couldn't imagine uh, 80 to 120 miles on the back of a donkey. She would have been an unhappy camper, to say the least. This manger scene, as pretty as it may be, there was a price that was paid by a teenage pregnant girl. Do you, know, do you realize this pregnant girl was pregnant due to the Holy Spirit. Now, how would that go over real good when your daughter comes home and says, hey, mom and dad, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She had a rough way to go. Joseph had a rough way to go. They all had a rough way to go. What to us is Christmas and what's so grand and what's so fun, a price was paid by a whole lot of people. I'm safe to assume she suffered a whole lot of ridicule, a whole lot of people pointing fingers at her. You know what I'm talking about? Just like we said in the song like Daniel sp uh, spoke a little while ago, living up to the expectations of maybe her mom and dad and then Joseph and everybody else. This was quite a journey. But now, in this song it says, a thrill of hope in the weary world rejoices. Due to her, due to Jesus, and the price was paid, now we can have hope and we can rejoice during this Christmas season. And as I just stated, people around seem to be weary all around me. Everybody I come in contact with, one word that describes people nowadays is weary and tired and worn out. One word captures the mood of about everybody I talk to and they say, I'm just weary and I'm tired, Pastor Dan, and I want some hope. Well, the good news this morning is, that's enough negative stuff. The good news this morning is we have hope in Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. The song says we have the thrill of hope because now with Jesus Christ, this weary world rejoices because now we've got a new and a glorious morning through Jesus Christ. A Savior has been born, a new and glorious morning. As I cross-referenced the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I went back to the book of Lamentations, and after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., there was a prophet named Jeremiah, and he writes in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, in Lamentations 3, 20 through 26, he says, I well remember them. My soul is downcast within me. I'll stop there for just a second. Verse 20 says, I well remember them. He's acknowledging the things that's going on around him. He's saying, my soul is downcast within me. Jeremiah is saying he's down and out. He's saying, yet this I call to mind. He's focusing here on God. Yet, see, back in this time, all of the people, they were down and out. They were weary. If you read in the book of Lamentations, chapter 1 through 3, it's a gloomy and doomy time. People are weary. People are tired. They're wore down and they're beat down. But he says, I remember them. He's acknowledging them. And he's saying, my soul is downcast within me. But yet this I call to mind. He said, I call this to mind means I'm focusing on God and God alone. And therefore, I have hope. Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Folks, when we're down and out and weary, we got to realize we are not going to be consumed because of God's great love, his great love. For his compassions do what? Never. And never means never. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. I say to myself, I say to myself, folks, you know what? A lot of times 
we're down and out. We feel like things have happened to us. Maybe we feel like folks is against us. Maybe we hadn't been encouraged. Whatever it may be, he says, I say to myself, I remember in the scriptures where the apostle Paul said, sometimes we got to encourage ourselves. Sometimes we got to pick ourselves up. You ever down and out and you want somebody to come along and email you or text you and encourage you? Sometimes there's not going to be anybody around other than you and God. Let's see what he says right here. The Lord, what is my portion? See, he's saying right here, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait on him. Waiting on the Lord is easy, isn't it, folks? Is that easy? Any of y'all got a spiritual gift of waiting Huh? You're going through a rough time, maybe job transition, maybe you're having some tough time with your kids or your parents or whatever, and oh man, it's just easy to wait on the Lord, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> it's not for me. I tell you what, I don't know of anybody that said, that's my spiritual gift, waiting on the Lord. But see, he's saying here, Jeremiah's saying, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Now let's look at verse 25 right here. The Lord is what? The Lord is good. To whom? To those whose hope is in who? Him. Folks, our only hope is in the Lord. Now we've got our spouses, we've got our friends, we've got our family, and I love them all. But it's not up to some other person to complete us. It's not. God's the only person. Jesus Christ is the only person who completes you and who completes me. I love premarital counseling when I'm looking at these guys who are in love and, you know, they come in there, oh, we want to get married. We just love one another and they're all Google-eyed and they just think it's going to be just great forever. And I'll sit in my office and they'll say, oh, he just completes me. And I'm sitting there going like, you know, that sounds good till after the honeymoon and you wake up and you got bad hair days and, you know, you get up and everybody looks like the young and restless, don't they? You know, you ever watch the young and restless, the soap opera shows? They just look pretty when they get up in the mornings and they got good breath. But, you know, real life, you get up in the morning, your hair's messed up, your breath's bad and all of that. But, you know, we expect people to complete us. God is the only one who completes us. When we get this thing right, we'll be able to do life okay. I say to myself. Now, who's talking here? We're having to say this to ourselves when we're going through a rough time. When we're down and out, we're saying to ourselves, we're encouraging ourselves. I've got a satellite radio in my car, and I've been listening to Joel Osteen all week because I've had a few rough days this week. But it, anything that I've heard from him, he's encouraging me and picking me up when I turn it on. He's always talking about being encouraged because the Lord is my portion. I heard him saying that yesterday. The Lord is my portion, therefore I'm going to wait on him. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who hope in him. we got to hope in the Lord. To the one who what? Seeks him. Folks, we've got to seek the Lord. We've got to seek him. A good relationship with Christ doesn't come automatically. It takes work on our behalf. People will say marriage is, I have people sit in my office and they'll say, oh, marriage, it's 50-50. I'm going to give 50, she's going to give 50, or he's going to give 50. Marriage is what? 100-100. Same way with our relationship with the Lord. It needs to be 100 and 100. We've got to have a relationship with him because the Lord is good to those who hope is in him to the one who seeks him. Folks, if we're not seeking the Lord, we're not going to find him. If your life's all messed up, you're going through a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of mess, guess what? Many, many times it's us who's moved, not the Lord. He never moves. He says in the scriptures, I will never leave you or I'll never forsake you. So if we feel very distant from God, if we're going through all kinds of stuff, if we're down and out, the Bible again says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. We ought to be seeking the Lord right when we wake up each and every morning before our feet hits the ground, we ought to be seeking him. And it is good, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The Bible says it's good. 
It's good. We'll be healthy. If you want to be a healthy Christian, you got to pray daily. You got to seek the Lord daily. It's not going to happen automatically. Coming in here on Sunday morning for an hour sermon and an hour's worth of music, it's not going to happen automatically. It takes work on our part. Let's talk about this morning a new day, a new day with Christ. See, a new day with Christ brings exactly what you need. Say exactly. Exactly what you need. Hmm? Need. Not what you want all the time. A lot of times our wants and our needs don't line up in God's eyes. See, he gives us everything that we need when we need it. He doesn't give us all of our greeds. Does that make sense? He gives us exactly what we need. Lamentation 3.24 Again says, I say to myself, again, I'm reminding myself, I'm, I'm encouraging myself. Think of it like this. Nobody's going to be around you all the time. If you're up at 5 o'clock in the morning, if you're going down the road at 6 o'clock in the evening by yourself, maybe you need some encouragement. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'm going to wait on him. So I've got to remind myself. I've got to encourage myself. I've got to encourage myself because, again, the Lord will give me exactly what I need. And again, there's two different things here not what I want, but what I need. And if we go back in biblical times and into the Old Testament, the Israelites, there were two and a half million of them wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. They had all kinds of complaints. They had a guy named Moses that delivered them from Pharaoh who had them as slaves and was torturing them and beating them and killing them and all of that. When they were delivered, he starts taking them out into the wilderness. They got hungry. They wanted food. They wanted a Golden Corral buffet, and it wasn't any around. What did God give them? He gave them what from heaven? Anybody remember? Manna, manna is something like grits. He dropped it out of the sky every morning, and they ate, and they were full. But they were not allowed to keep it until the next day. When they tried to do that, they couldn't store it up. It would mold. It would rot. They couldn't keep it for the next day. Now, why did God do that? He could have dropped enough manna out of, hev out of heaven. He could have gave them all deep freezers, anything he wanted to do because he's God. But he wanted those folks to depend upon him each and every day. He wants us to do the same thing. But see, we like our securities. We like to do it our way. You know what I'm talking about there? We go to work, we have our savings account, we have our stocks, our bonds, we have our deep freezers, we have our pantries full of food. Our only hope lies in us many times we think. The Lord don't see it that way. He wants us to depend on him for manna each day. See, he showed the Israelite that they received manna. What he was showing them was that he was enough for them each and every day. And guess what? He's enough for us today. Anything extra back then would rot. Anything extra would, would rot. See, he tried to teach them that. Maybe he's trying to teach us that today. Everything we need, he's going to give it to us today. In the New Testament... Jesus gives us our daily bread, our daily bread. That's what we need to be praying for, our daily bread. See, the thing about it is God is already in control of tomorrow, and he's already got tomorrow figured out. The Bible says don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. Can I get an amen on that? Today has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. We should be praying, God, give us today our daily bread, because God already knows what you need tomorrow. He's got it under control. He's got your back. He knows what you need tomorrow, and it's sitting there waiting on you tomorrow. You ever lose a job, and you sit there and wonder, man, I lost this job, and I thought I was supposed to be here forever. Well, six months down the road, you've been drawing unemployment, and you're going, what in the world am I going to do? I'm out of money. I'm out of this, that, or the other. Why is God allowing this to happen to me. And then he comes through, and he gives you a better job than you had before. You know? He's always coming through. He already knows what you need tomorrow. Folks, he already knows 
what your marriage needs tomorrow. What your marriage needs tomorrow. He already knows what your broken family needs to heal your broken family. He knows if your kids have gone cuckoo and how to bring them back to him. He knows, kids, how your parents have gone cuckoo also and how to make all of y'all get along. He really does. He knows when you're hurting. He knows when you're experiencing discomfort. But Job writes, in this world, we will have trouble. In this world, we will have trouble. God's already in control of tomorrow. And he's wanting us to wait on him and put our trust and our faith in him. He's got our back. He's got it covered. So a new day with Christ brings exactly what you need. The next thing, a new day with Christ, a new day with Christ brings the hope to keep going. Say hope. Hope. The hope to keep going. A new morning's coming. A new morning's coming. That night in the manger with baby Jesus in the feeding trough, the new day, that had to be dark and gloomy, but the new day when the sun came up and they had a brand new start and a brand new beginning, it's the hope to keep going. It's the thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices when all around us seems dark. The weary world can rejoice through Jesus Christ. Lamentation 3.25 says again, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. My question, folks, this morning, are we really seeking God this morning? Are you seeking God? Now, I, I know you're going through troubles and trials. We all are. We all have uncertainties. We all have issues. We all have families that's got problems in them. We know that. But are we seeking the Lord first? And are we waiting on him, allowing him to fix the problems? Or are we Tim the tool man? We fix it up ourselves, right? When all else fails, we're going to fix it ourselves. It doesn't matter what it is. We are fixers. Any of y'all out here fixers? Let me see your hands. Anybody fixers? I know I am. I want to fix it. I want to fix it. I don't want to wait on the Lord. I want to fix it myself. You got me? I want to fix it myself. The Lord says we got to wait on him. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He's our refuge. He is our strength. He's what your marriage needs. He's what your family needs. He's what your kids need. He's what your parents need. He's what your friends and neighbors all around you need. He is our hope. He is our strength. A new day with Christ brings the hope to keep going. Again, the Lord is good to those who hope in him. Are we hoping for him? Are we hoping? Are we putting our hope in him? I heard this saying many, many years ago. It said, people, as people, we can live 40 days without food. We can live eight days without water. We can live up to four minutes without oxygen. But we can only live a few seconds without hope. So many people I come in contact with feel hopeless. Many people feel hopeless. Many people today are struggling they're putting their hope in the wrong places. They're putting their hope in the stock market, in their company, in their job that they've got, in other persons. And they're hoping that it's going to make them complete. Maybe their 401 retirement plan, their job securities, some person to make you complete. Our hope is in Christ. It is in Christ alone. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold let us hold. What? Unswervingly. Unswervingly. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Don't just say we're Christians. Don't we just say, hey, I went to church Sunday morning. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We better be born again. We better have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We better be following him, and he better be the Lord of our life. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is what? He is faithful. He is faithful. We're to wait on the Lord. 
And it's an amazing, it's amazing the difference that one day can make. We've been doing several series this year, and what come up in my mind was Lazarus dying, and he was dead for four days. Y'all remember that one? Lazarus died, he was dead for four days. It was back in the summer. What happened day number five? Day number five, Jesus come rolling in. He come rolling in. He said he's only asleep. King James Version talks about Lazarus, and it says he stinketh. That must be pretty bad if he stinketh, you know? You look at other people, and you'll say, hmm, they smell, they stink, whatever. King James Version says he stinketh. So that's, he was pretty rank. He had been laying there dead for four days. Jesus comes rolling in. Everybody's wanting Jesus to come and do something. His sister's just running around. Lord, if you'd have only been here, he wouldn't have died. Been laying here four days dead. That's dead. Four days is dead, guys. He'd be smelling, okay? He says he's only asleep. And what does he do? He heals them. Get up, Lazarus. Take off. Jesus raised him from the dead. Everybody knew he was dead. Everybody knew it. No questions asked. I feel like if he's only dead for a day or two, people might have questioned it, but everybody knew it because he's dead for four days. Day number five made a big difference. Maybe you're on the verge of a breakthrough. Maybe you've been through four days of pure hell on earth. I don't know what you've been through, but you do. You got me? Maybe you've been through it. Day number five is a new day. The sun's out. Jesus has came. We can have hope through him. He can give us the hope to keep going because he's going to give us exactly what we need. He's going to give us exactly what we need. And he's going to give us the help that you're seeking. He's going to give us the help that you're seeking. With Jesus, we're going to receive the help that we're seeking. Lamentations 3.26 says, again, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The help that you're seeking this morning is probably from the Lord. It's not from everybody else around you. Again, Lazarus was dead four days. How about the woman in the scriptures that had the blood issues for 12 years that needed to be healed? 12 years she was sick. Everybody knew she was sick. Jesus comes along after 12 years and heals her. There's a man who had been sitting by the pool for 38 years and couldn't get over to the pool Jesus said, pick up your mat, follow me. He hadn't been able to walk since birth. 38 years in a day, Jesus comes by, heals him, pick up your mat and walk. It was a miracle, wasn't it? And everybody knew it was a miracle. Sometimes what you're going through, you've done tried it your way, and it's not working, but God's going to fix it, and he's going to receive the glory and the credit. A lot of things we go through, and so we'll give God all of, the great, uh, all of the praise and all of the glory. We need to depend upon the Lord. See, all of us in here today have one thing in common. We have to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. I was talking to a guy right before the service, and we was talking about the mortality rates 100%. Did y'all know that? Mortality rates 100%. All of us is going to die. We're standing out there, and before you're talking about a 25-year-old girl being sick and got cancer bad, and she's not getting any better. I was talking about a 30-year-old neighbor of mine who got a brain tumor a year ago, two years ago, and he died in less than a year. Mortality rate is 100%. We've all got one thing in common. We're all going to die. The other thing we've got in common is we need to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of our life if we want to go to heaven. There's one way into heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the the life. Jesus is telling us this morning, we need to pick up our mat. We need to get out of our old stuff and pick up our mat and follow him. That's what he's telling us. He's telling us there's a new day coming, a new day coming. Tomorrow's already planned for you. 24 hours from tomorrow, from today is already planned. Romans 3, 11 and 12, the hour has come for you to wake up. Mm, the hour has come. For you to what? Wake up from your slumber. Wow. That's big right there, folks. I don't know if that speaks to you or not, but I sit and ask myself, what am I doing with most of my time? What am I chasing in the world? What am I doing in the world? What's really important in the world? 
The Bible says the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than it was when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The day is almost here. See, the Son of God, he rose again for each and every one of us. This song, O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. See, this author that wrote this song, he didn't know Jesus, but he wrote this poem. He wrote the poem here. He knew the lyrics. Folks, do we know the lyrics this morning? Do we know the end of the story? What are we putting our hope in? Again, Romans 3 says, The hour has come for you to wake up from everything else that you've been doing, all of the other stuff that's important. Is it really important? Huh? Is it really important? All the things that we do each and every day. Do they have any eternal value? My buddy also told me this morning, he said, Yeah, I've never seen a dead person going down the road with an armored car going behind them taking all their money when they put them in the grave. We chase the world and the stuff in the world, and we worry about all of the little things, and we don't emphasize Jesus like we do the things of the world. The hour has come for you to wake up from your laziness, from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than it was when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Isaiah 33, 2 says, O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength. When? Every morning. Every morning. Isaiah 33, 2. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning. Our salvation in time of distress. Our salvation in time of distress. I'm going to read that one more time in closing. Isaiah 33, 2 says, Our Lord, O Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning. Our salvation in time of distress. Hey, let's pray. Father God, today, these words that we've talked about out of the Scriptures, they're important words. Lord, you bring a new day and you, need a, you bring a new start and you, need a, you, you bring a new beginning to each and every one of our lives when we seek you with all of our heart and when we put you first. Jesus, you say you are the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way into heaven except through you. As we're closing this service and sitting here in these moments, would you guys just allow God, through his Holy Spirit, to touch your heart right now. Would you do this? Would you just ask yourself, what is your top priority in life right now? Are you allowing Jesus Christ to bring you the hope that you need? Our only hope today is in the Lord, is in Jesus. That's our only hope. Father, today is you're checking our spirits right now and as we're searching our hearts and as we're trying to hear a fresh word from you. Holy Spirit, would you just penetrate our hearts? Would you give us a heart transplant right now where we're at? Would you give us a freshness and a newness? Would you change us right now and make us more like you? God, it's our desire as a church that we're serving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's during services like this that you can come and you can minister to us and you can heal us everywhere that we're hurting right now because, Lord, you are the hope for the hopeless. You are the help for the hurting. If you're hurting this morning and you need some hope and you want Jesus to come and restore your hope and you want to put your hope in him and you want your life to be complete through a man called Jesus, will you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Just ask you to slip up your hand so I can pray for you. Amen. Amen. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. See your hands. Amen. Father God, today, please forgive us of our sins. Come into our hearts right now. 
Give us a brand new start. Give us a brand new beginning. Help us to stay single focused, realizing, God, that our only hope is in you alone. Forgive us when we strayed away and not put you first. And from this day forward, give us a new beginning right now. You tell us in the scriptures over and over again, you are the God of new beginnings. God, do a do over in each and every one of us in this service today. Make us more like you. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's children said, amen, amen. amen.